This is Amanda Edwards, and I'd like to welcome you to the Edwards Empowerment Talks. This podcast provides a platform to empower individuals and the community by showcasing stories of resilient people who have refused to let life's challenges prevent them from achieving their dreams. The Edwards Empowerment Talks will also highlight the work being done in the community that will help to positively shift the trajectory of this nation through stories of adversity, perseverance, drive, struggle, and success, the podcast will empower others to believe in their dreams and pursue those dreams despite whatever challenges may come their way. It is also a vehicle to equip the community with the tools necessary to be the change they want to see. I welcome you to tune in. You don't want to miss this. Welcome to another episode of the Edwards Empowerment Talks. This week, we have the opportunity to speak to one of my personal favorites, Lex Frieden. Lex has used his entire life to make sure that the challenges he's experienced have not been in vain. In fact, he has co-authored and is affectionately known as the architect of the ADA. That's the Americans with Disabilities Act. I'm so excited to have Lex here because because he is a testament to the notion of making sure that your life and experiences that you encounter make a difference in someone else's life. So again, without further ado, I want to welcome and introduce Lex Frieden. Thank you, Lex, for joining us today. Amanda, it's a pleasure for me to be on your program and to speak with you again. I'm I'm always... uh, uh, reinforced by the attitude that you have and and the uh, that the outright joy for life. Well, thank you. Well, I appreciate you adding us to the list of of things to do. And of course, I know you've got lots of uh, pull and tug on your time. And so, I want to go ahead and get started and. Uh, As I may have mentioned to you and for those that are listening or tuning in for the first time, the point of our empowerment talks is really to focus on how people have used the challenges and adversities they've experienced and and either use that as an opportunity for uh, to do good in the community or in terms of really just a pivot point in their own lives. And so, Lex, can you share some background on you? I know that now many people know you in regards you very highly because of the work that you've done, but tell us about Young Lex. Well, I, I mean, a lot of my life was shaped by an experience I had when I graduated from high school and started college and uh, was in a head-on collision with some other students in another car. Um, I broke my neck, and uh, I didn't know what that meant, what the implications of that were at the time, but Uh, The reality was I wouldn't be able to move my arms and legs after my neck was broken. And I had the good fortune to come to Houston to Tier Memorial Hermann Hospital for rehabilitation and went back to uh, Oklahoma to my home and applied for college again and was turned down because they said they did not accept people with disabilities on their campus. And... uh, That was pretty shocking to me because that was 1968. Mm -hmm. We had, uh, you know, we we had all celebrated the Civil Rights Act, and I thought that was ending discrimination. But obviously, it didn't end discrimination for those of us with disabilities, and frankly, neither for uh, uh, people who were discriminated against because of race or other aspects, characteristics that they might have. So... I, I became, you know, an advocate. I guess that experience shocked me into a certain reality that I've tried to address throughout my life, and I've had the good fortune to be in some uh, unique situations and be able to influence legislation and attitudes, and that's been 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 good for me. So let's go back a little bit. So when you were growing up in in Oklahoma, um, and and you had the car accident. Did you at that time get discouraged in terms of thinking that this was going to impede your ability to actually go to school or were you optimistic still in the face of the the car accident? That's a great question, Amanda. When I broke my neck, I I really wasn't concerned. I mean, I knew I had a serious injury and 
and my desire was to live, which which I did. And mm-hmm. uh, living with a disability didn't seem to be a problem to me at that point in time, even though they told me I would have to use a wheelchair perhaps the rest of my life. I thought about our astronauts. We had men on the way to the moon. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and and those astronauts had all kinds of technology. And I was pretty certain that I would be the beneficiary of that technology and all that research and and that there really wouldn't be any barriers to me despite the fact that I was using a wheelchair for mobility. It never occurred to me that people's attitude about me would be different because I was using a wheelchair than it would be if I were walking onto their campus. And uh, that was shocking to me. And when you had the accident, that was your junior year in high school? I was uh, actually a freshman in college. Okay, okay. So then tell me about this co- your app- the application to school and when you got the rejection, how candid were they? How frank were they in terms of just simply saying no because of the disability? Well, I had been going to Oklahoma State University in Stillwater, and having been a student there for about a month and a half, I knew the the campus was not really accessible. I can remember steps on all the buildings. I even remembered opening the door for a guy with a wheelchair on the back of a building near the near the uh, service entrance and asking him why he didn't use another door. And he said there was no other door to the building. And, and uh, all of those things led me not to reapply at Oklahoma State University, but instead to apply at one of the new built universities west of the Mississippi, one that was uh, probably the most modern uh, in the Western states at that time, and that was Oral Roberts University in Tulsa. Uh, They had a completely new built campus. There was a brand new level. All the buildings were accessible. They they were recording lectures of uh, courses at that time, and no other campus in the country. No other college was doing that. Mm -hmm. So I I thought that was the perfect place for me. And besides that, the the president and founder of the university was a Methodist, and I'd been a Methodist all my life. So I figured there's a natural fit there somewhere. Mm -hmm. And uh, and I I applied, and I got a rejection letter, and I I was confident that the letter was missent. I called uh, the dean of admissions office and, and actually spoke to the dean and said, I, I'm pretty sure I, I got the wrong letter here. And he got my file and said, no. He said, you received the letter you should have received. And I said, I don't understand that. Did you get my high school transcript? Did you see I was valedictorian of my high school class? Did you see that I was in the top five percentile in the national uh, uh, qualifying exams? Did you see that I had a presidential scholarship that would pay my tuition to any university in the country? Uh, Yes, he said, you've got a good record in school. And I couldn't figure out what the problem was. And then I thought, oh, yeah, this is Oral Roberts. And I said, did you get the letter of recommendation from my Methodist minister? And and, uh, he said, yes, you did very well in Sunday school, too. And I and I was at a loss for words. I couldn't imagine what the problem was. And I said, so, so what's the problem? And he said, you've indicated on your application that you use a wheelchair for mobility, and our policy is not to admit students with disabilities on our campus. And I was speechless, Amanda. I couldn't, I, I dropped the phone. I, 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 you know, I couldn't speak to my mother about it. I was living at home at the time. I couldn't tell my father. I couldn't even tell my sister three days passed before I could tell anybody about that call because I felt guilty. I mean, it was, you know, all my plans, all my hopes and my family had invested in my dreams as well were, were, you know, they were set aside by this decision that was based on a characteristic for which I had no control. And, and that I, I couldn't talk about. It's hard to talk about it today. Mm-hmm. Um, the, it made me feel guilty because I was who I was. It made me feel guilty. Uh, and, and that's a terrible feeling. And uh, it made me ashamed of myself. And it took me uh, uh, quite a while to get over that. A few weeks after that, um, 
uh, a friend of my father's suggested that we go and meet with the dean of admissions at the University of Tulsa across town. And I said to my father, I said, we've been by that university. There are steps everywhere. It was built to look like an Ivy League turn-of-the-century college. Why, why would we even consider that? And my dad said, well, let, you know, let's be respectful of our colleague who suggested that you go and meet with the dean, and he's arranged the meeting. So, so we went, and we met with the dean in the parking lot. We couldn't get up the curb to the sidewalk, much less up the steps to his office. And the dean was very accommodating. He said, we've seen your record. We saw your transcript. You're the kind of student we'd like to have on the campus. We go all over the country. We have an elite school, and we're trying to recruit elite students, and you fit. And I said, the problem is I don't fit your buildings. I don't fit mm -hmm. your architecture. And he said, well, he said, it's true. Uh, but we have great students here. He said, I'm sure they'd be glad to lift you up and down the steps anytime uh, you're here for class. And I said, I, I appreciate that. But the reality is that's a big job. And I don't want to put other people at risk on my account. And frankly, I don't feel too safe being lifted up and down steps myself. Mm -hmm. And he thought for a minute and he said, look across the campus. That's the first new building we're it's under construction. We've built it according to modern standards. It'll have a level entrance and an elevator. And maybe you could go to school there. And I said, uh, what, do they, what are you planning to teach there? He said, biology. And I said, nope, that lets me out. <laughs> I wasn't interested in biology. And he took a second and he said, but wait. He said, take the catalog home. He said, figure out what courses you want to take. Call and tell me, and the courses will be in that building. And th th that was, uh, you know, that spark of brilliance, that idea, really set the, the frame the Americans with Disabilities Act. I mean, we, one of the biggest issues that we in the disability community had in advocating for our rights was the complaint that it doesn't, we, it doesn't cost anything to accommodate people on the basis of race or gender. It doesn't cost anything. You just have to change your policies and your attitudes. Mm -hmm. But disability, that's going to be cost. You're going to have to rebuild uh, you know, all the buildings and rebuild the infrastructure. And, and it's more than just attitude and uh, inclusion. And, and uh, we, we were able to use that example and others like it to say, look, it doesn't cost anything if you use your head. They had all these buildings with all these classes, but the ones that people with disabilities on the campus needed to have access to could easily be taught in that new building. And, and, and from that point on, the university started to make all their facilities accessible. And by the time I graduated, there were two or three buildings that were then accessible, and now all of them are, of course. Mm -hmm. But that, that that kind of, uh, you know, that spark of brilliance there by that dean on the tarmac outside his office to say, look, you know, we don't have to rebuild the building to accommodate you. We just have to move our program where you can reach it. And uh, I remember telling a story like that to a senator who questioned uh, he, his brother, operated a lumber yard in uh, in a rural town in texas and and the senator said you know this is gonna my brother-in-law doesn't have that and my brother doesn't have that much business anyway and uh and this could cost him a lot to try and make all his offices and buildings accessible to somebody in a wheelchair and i said don't you think he could carry a piece of wood down the steps to show me what it looked like and the senator, I mean, it was just kind of an awakening experience. And uh, that, that senator voted for the ADA. So, there, you know, we've made a lot of uh, progress. And now, because we've, we have laws in place to, uh, to affect new buildings, you know, we are, in effect, changing the infrastructure. And at the same time, we're changing attitudes. And those are the two big big results of the Americans with Disabilities Act here now 30 years after. Well, that's an incredible story. And one, I think that 
really sparked a new way of thinking because as you mentioned before, it was a situation where people really thought it was someone else's responsibility, another student to take you up and down the stairs, which is not only a, a like you highlighted, a safety risk for you is a safety risk for them. And thinking of it as something which as a public or as a community, everybody in our community should be able to access uh, buildings and spaces and and places, I think is a, unfortunately, it was a very late, um, a late dis, uh, decision that was made, but of course, one that is extremely important for all of our community. So thank you for sharing that. Let me ask this question. When you were a student, um, in, did you ever get a dis discouraged um, still being on campus had to have posed some additional challenges to you were you ever discouraged or was that really the the big paramount uh, adversity or obstacle that you had to co overcome was the admission process itself no I, I don't remember being discouraged after that all, all of the instructors that I had uh, when I was in college were very understanding and accommodating. Uh, biology is an interesting case in point. I actually did have to pass a course in biology to get a degree in psychology. And, uh, and so I you remember, couldn't get out of it. You couldn't get out of that. <laughs> I, I, I remember being frustrated because I realized that the, the, some of the exams would involve looking through a microscope. And from my wheelchair, I could not get up to the microscopes that were on the big lab tables. And, uh, and I said that to my instructor. I said, I, I don't know how I'm going to pass this exam because I cannot see, the, I can't get to the microscope. And she said, I've got a solution to that. So the next day she came and she had a, a book of photographs that had been taken of the elements that were on the slide under the microscope. And uh, she, you know, the, the exam then was to look at these pictures as you would see the, 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 the uh, object or the cells or whatever they were in the microscope and identify them. And, you know, that was an accommodation, but it was a, for her an obvious one and a logical one. And, and today, interestingly enough, and they teach biology online, and rather than use microscopes, they use the kinds of pictures that she showed me. Mm. And that's that's fantastic. And, and I think that it's also something worth noting is that you really try to push forward in thinking of solutions and, and ways to overcome the challenges that you did encounter uh, along the way. So let me ask this question and, and kind of move along outside of the university context. You graduated. Uh, what did you think was going to be next? What did you want to be? What did you want to do? And then, of course, what did you end up actually doing? Well, like many people, Amanda, I, the, my objective was to get a college degree, and I had no idea what I was going to do <laughs> after that. I remember a meeting with my advisor near graduation time, and, and uh, she said to me, well, Lex, congratulations, you're going to have your degree, um, but I got to tell you that an undergraduate degree in psychology won't get you a job working in a, a 5 and 10 store. And, uh, the, and she said, my suggestion is you may want to consider graduate school, which I did. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and I had that, that's another, you know, you have these, th these experiences in life and sometimes you plan for them and other times they just happen and, and they're, they're good experiences. So one of the schools I applied to for graduate school was the university of Houston. And I was accepted here and, uh, moved to Houston. And uh, that was 1972. And, uh, and the University of Houston was one of the first schools in the country to actually add ramps to buildings. And that was a result of a research project being done by a psychology professor on campus. Hmm. The professor's idea was to put ramps down at the building next to steps, and then students would go out and watch how other students behaved, whether they used the steps or the ramps. And the, the, the research proved that people, if there's an option between walking up steps or up a ramp, will choose the ramp. 
And uh, so those ramps were all there for us in wheelchairs. And uh, and uh, the campus was very accessible. I uh, wound up with a degree in social psychology uh, from the University of Houston. And before I could finish that, I had a job offer from Dr. DeBakey at Baylor College of Medicine. He wanted me to work on a on a project at Tier with my mentor, who was Dr. William Spencer, the founder of Tier, and uh, we, you know, that 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 to me was a, a great opportunity. And both Dr. Spencer and and Dr. DeBakey were mentors of mine, and I, you know, they they saw in me the desire to uh, to help people and to make positive change in our environment and. And they supported that. They they both encouraged me. Uh, one time when I was a graduate student, I accompanied Dr. Spencer to a meeting in New York. One of the icons of the rehabilitation and disability movement is a man named Howard Rusk, who started the Rusk Institute in New York at NYU. And uh, I was at the meeting with Dr. Spencer in Dr. Rusk's Institute, uh, going to the, the the committee that we'd been invited to, and never had hoped to even see, much less meet Dr. Rusk. But I saw Dr. Spencer talking with a gentleman, and Dr. Spencer flagged me over, and sure enough, that was uh, Dr. Rusk. And the, the the significant aspect of this story, Amanda, is that when Spencer introduced me, he didn't introduce me as a student. He didn't introduce me as a patient. He introduced me as his colleague. And to be introduced to a man whom those of us in that field studied as the premier pioneer, as a colleague, placed upon me a great deal of responsibility. I mean, from that moment on, I had to live up to the uh, to the role, to the model that... Uh, that Bill Spencer and Howard Rusk and the other icons of the field I was studying uh, had uh, had established. So th those kind of mentorships are important, and I know you support that. So I wanted to to pass that on. But uh, uh, my uh, Dr. DeBakey also encouraged me to go to Washington and work for uh, President Reagan. I that that was a unique opportunity, and and. And a lot of things happened then. In order for that to happen, I, I was testified before Congress. Uh, the Congress asked me what I would do if I could change laws. I told them at that time, I almost said you should have a, a law uh, prohibiting discrimination on the basis of disability. But I said, I'm only one person, and I'm not about to represent 36 million with a question like that. My advice is to create a blue ribbon panel have the president appoint its members and have them produce a report answering that question for you. And that was added as an amendment to the bill they were considering at the time. The bill passed. What was uh, the, the bill? What was the bill? Uh, that was the amendments to the Rehabilitation Act of 1983. Mm -hmm. the, uh, the bill passed. The, the uh, National Council on the Handicapped was created at that time. There were 15 people appointed by the president, and uh, the White House called and asked me if I would be the executive director of that agency. And I said, after some thought and counseling with my wife, yes, I, I would do that. Um, <laughs> three days later, they called back and said, we discovered that you were a, a, a delegate on behalf of the person, Mr. Mondale, who ran against Mr. Reagan. So maybe you're not eligible to do this job. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I said, Politics. Well, I, I didn't think that was, you know, I didn't, I didn't know that this was a political job. And they informed me any job that that you do for the administration mm -hmm. is a political job. I was pretty naive at that point. But the guy said, the head of presidential personnel said, you know, if you can have somebody call me and vouch for you within 30 minutes, we might change our mind. And I didn't know any anybody who knew the president, but I had a, it, it, just in the back of my mind, there was a woman, a wonderful woman, who 
helped change the beds at the at the facility where I was living, and uh, she she was married to the to the president and the founder, really, of Channel 13, Willard Walbridge. And and I thought, based on Mrs. Walbridge's conversation with her and so on, that her husband just might be a, a Republican. So I called his office and spoke to his assistant, who said he was busy and I wasn't able to talk to him. But she said I'd, she'd take a message. And I told her, I said, I, I just spoke to the White House, and they need somebody to make a recommendation for me who has credibility with the president. And it just occurred to me that Mr. Walbridge might. And the assistant said, well, judging by his mail, he certainly does have uh, have a relationship with the president. And I said, well, you know, I don't know him personally, but he can speak to his wife and she knows me very well. And the assistant said, I'll pass the message along to Mr. Walbridge. Well, before the 30 minutes was up, I got a call back from the director of presidential personnel in the White House who said to me, well, I really never have seen anybody do that, and I didn't expect you to be able to do it. But I'm telling you, when Willard Walbridge called the president and spoke on your behalf, everything got healed in a minute. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I said, well, thank you for passing that along. Um, he said, you know, Mr. Walbridge said there wasn't a good Republican in Texas who wasn't first a Democrat. <laughs> so I, I didn't tell him I wasn't going to become a Republican, that I was going to stay pretty neutral. But, but I did do the job for four years, and it gave me an opportunity to, uh, to meet George Bush, who became the number one advocate for the ADA. We were scheduled to present our recommendation to President Reagan, in 1986 when the space shuttle challenger blew up and so that meeting was canceled it was all set up reagan was going to have a press conference and announce that his administration supported disability rights and civil rights for people with disabilities that took us a quite a bit of effort considering that reagan was not known as a civil rights advocate Mm -hmm. But uh, that was the plan. But the meeting was canceled. The press conference was canceled. And we instead met with the vice president. And at first we were disappointed by that. But when George Bush talked about his personal experience with disability, and when he said that he and Barbara had read our report the night before we met him and that they wanted to support us, I had the feeling that this thing was really going to get moving. And uh, when we left Bush at the end of our meeting, he said, I'm just the vice president, but if I can help you further in the future, I will. That was prophetic because two years later, as, as history shows, he was the president of the United States. And on his first uh, speech before a joint session of Congress, he endorsed our bill. So mm. that, you know, those things just happen. Sometimes you just have to be in the right place at the right time and know the right people. Yeah, and, and let me ask this question. How long did it take for you all to come up with your recommendations? It took us two years. I mean, we started, we had an idea in, in 1984. We, we already had a concept. The first inclination was to amend the Civil Rights Act of 1964. Mm -hmm. And in fact, uh, there was discussion in the original record uh, about whether people with disabilities should be included. And twice after that, in 1968 and 1971, members of the House actually brought up amendments to include disability in the Civil Rights Act. Uh, but by, you know, by 1980, we had figured out that that was probably a non-starter. The, the, the civil rights advocates did not want to include disability because they pointed out the remedies were significantly different for discrimination on the basis of disability than they were for discrimination on the basis of race or gender. And so we, um, we decided that a freestanding piece of legislation was probably the best approach, and, and uh, we pretty well agreed on that. By 1986, we had two years of hearings around the country to develop support for the recommendation. And it took two years after we made the recommendation before a bill actually got introduced. We, 
we were thinking that Congress would in, introduce a bill after we made the recommendation in 1986. But two years later, when we looked back, all of our recommendations had been followed except that one. And we just came to the conclusion that they didn't know how to say what we wanted to say. So we did a draft bill and, and a senator from Connecticut who had a child with a disability, Senator Weicker's child had Down syndrome. We, uh, we, we got the bill introduced. And uh, at the same time, a senator from Iowa, Tom Harkin, whose brother was deaf uh, on the Democratic side, picked up the bill after the Congress changed and he led the bill all the way through till its passage. Uh, we had a lot of supporters and a lot of, a lot of work and people with disabilities were contacting their, their representatives day after day after day. There were marches. One of the, one of the preeminent events was uh, in January of 1990 before the bill was signed, I think January or February. The bill was stalled in the House because there were a lot of small business folks who, who did not want to be required not to discriminate on the basis of disability. I don't understand that. But the National Association of Businesses was fighting us and really had the ear of some members of Congress whom they supported. And uh, at that point, a group of about 100, maybe 150 people, wheelchair users, went to the Capitol and literally got out of their wheelchairs and dragged themselves up the steps of the Capitol. Wow. That, that, that press event really created a lot of attention. Uh, any of the remaining obstacles on the hill were sort of disappeared at that point in time. Wow. And the bill... The bill just kind of flew the way the rest of the way through till President Bush signed it in uh, July 26, 1990. Now, whose idea was it to have that powerful imagery and visual that was created by having individuals in wheelchairs pull themselves up the stairs out, you know, getting out of the wheelchairs and then pulling themselves up the stairs without it? Yeah, well, I, you know, it's hard to say exactly whose idea that was, but the group that sponsored it the pre, the, was the group called ADAPT. Uh, American Disabled for Accessible Public Transit was the, their, their, their full name at that time, and, and later they've expanded. Uh, the leader, one of the leaders of that group is a Texan and a former Houstonian named Bob Kafka, and Bob lives in Austin now, but that... Uh, that that group inspired about 100, 150 people to go to the Capitol and and crawl up those steps, and that was a, a very meaningful moment. I have have a video which I'll share with you about that. Yes, I'd love that. I'd love that, and I think it's something that people aren't usually conscious of. You know, in terms of the challenges. You know, it may be considered to be an inconvenience in terms of making a modification or you know, an accommodation if you're on the side of, of not having a challenge. But if you're this person who can't access a building or in your case can't access school uh, because of that, it's it's much more substantial in terms of the impact on your life than any considered or perceived inconvenience that it could cause someone else. So I, I think that was probably a very powerful way of, of illustrating that message. So um, that's, that's fascinating. So, okay. So you have the bill, you have a bill sponsored. Did you think, uh, you had gotten past the, the, the contingency of the business group that was, uh, was not supportive after you had that moment? Was there any other obstacle that you faced? Was there dissension among the, uh, you know, the disability community even? Oh, there were some small issues. Obviously you don't get a bill that comprehensive through the Congress without some hiccups, but uh, one of them had to do with uh, transit. The, the over-the-road uh, bus companies, Greyhound, did not want to put lifts on their buses. Uh, they said it wouldn't be, you know, cost-effective. And uh, we had objection from other transit agencies, but that was overcome largely because uh, people like Bob Lanier in Houston uh, testified before Congress that that would be an appropriate thing for transit agencies to do. 
mm-hmm. and uh, we had uh, uh, we had objection. Some of the members of Congress who wanted to fight the ADA, but they didn't want to confront people with disabilities, said it was an HIV bill. They said it would allow it, that if this bill passed, uh, people who had HIV or AIDS would be in restaurants serving meals and cooking, and uh, people would become infected by the the passage of this bill. And I, I, obviously that was totally off the wall, but it was a kind of a fear-mongering approach to, uh, uh, to fight the bill. And uh, a senator actually got up in the final debate and, and made those accusations. But wow. uh, that senator was uh, one of only four who voted against the bill in final passage. So talk about was, being on the wrong side of history, right? He was sort of outnumbered there. Well, I think that uh, it's it's a tremendous feat that you were able to navigate through uh, some of the challenges that you had in in terms of getting that passed. So let's let's focus on. Okay, now what? We've got a bill that's passed. You had only four votes against it. Is that right? And in the Senate, yeah. In the Senate side. And now we have law. So how difficult was it? You know, you, everybody's excited. It, there was a celebration. Oftentimes that can be the case. And then, of course, then you realize there's something called enforcement and there's something called implementation there. And tell me a little bit about the journey after the passage of the ADA in terms of getting people to comply uh, and, and, and just to come up to speed and also the, the lack of awareness. Um, You are very perceptive. That clearly is the issue. Uh, And we learned that early on because in 1973, Ted Kennedy made an amendment to a bill called the Rehabilitation Act. The Rehabilitation Act provided funding to states to educate people with disabilities and to prepare them to work. And uh, the Congress wanted to add independent living to that bill. They wanted to support people in their homes and in the community. But the uh, uh, the the administration, Ray uh, Nixon, vetoed the bill on two occasions. Uh, so they dropped that from the bill, but they added a section that Kennedy uh, wanted to add that said there cannot be discrimination in federal programs. In other words, federally uh, supported buildings had to be accessible. Federally supported programs had to be accessible. That was 1973. Mm-hmm. Well, that that passed in the bill, and the president was tired of vetoing this bill, and it didn't have the big dollar uh, independent living section in it, so he uh, he signed it, but nobody knew what that meant, mm-hmm. and and so there were never regulations written, and they weren't enforced. I mean, that bill could have uh, protected me and others when we applied for college, but there was no enforcement mechanism because there were no regulations. Mm -hmm. Finally, after sit-ins and federal office buildings around the country by people with disabilities here in Houston, we did that. Um, The bill was actually, uh, the regulations were written and they were finally signed under President Carter uh, by Joe Califano, who was the uh, Secretary of Health, Education and Welfare. That was 1978 five years after the bill, and and we had no enforcement until then. So we knew that going into ADA, and and Bush was aware of it. So when the bill passed, President Bush said he expected the agencies to produce regulations within one year of passage. And, uh, And all of the agencies actually delivered, except one, I think that was the Department of Transportation, and it took them an extra year to produce their regulations. But we had regulations almost from the beginning and enforcement by the Department of Justice under uh, under uh, Bush, under uh, uh, Clinton, under Obama, uh, under Bush too. There was substantial enforcement, and and frankly, there continues. The Justice Department continues to enforce the ADA 
uh, despite other cutbacks. So uh, we're very fortunate in that and fortunate to have the regulations, which are very, very clear and straightforward. So what would you say is kind of the next uh, horizon, if you will, in terms of disabilities rights and making sure that enforcement, you said, is, is still, you know, something that is, is taken seriously, but where are there gaps? Where are there areas for advocacy for those that want to push the needle forward even more so? Because what I've heard you say without saying directly is that it seemed like your goals always evolved. So you didn't start, you didn't stop once you had the landmark legislation passed, then you went to this phase of making sure that implementation and enforcement uh, was a part of that journey. And then, of course, now, what are some of the things that people out there might need to push for or be aware of that they may not have access to that knowledge already? Well, one of the big issues actually was set up, set forth by the Supreme Court in their decision on Olmstead, and that occurred in about 1998, as I recall. Olmstead was uh, uh, considered, and the court said that people with disabilities needed to be able to live in the least restrictive environment. So that enabled us to get people out of institutions and into the community. But at the same time, we have not kept pace with the need for accessible housing in the community. Furthermore, there are 76 million baby boomers, people over the age of 65 now, who are baby boomers and they don't want to live in congregate housing. They don't want to live in nursing homes. They want to stay and age in place in their own homes. And we do not have an infrastructure to support community living, and we need to develop that. It's not really required by the ADA, but the ADA does say that people need to be supported in the least restrictive environment. So uh, we need caregivers, we need accessible housing, and we need to work on new updates for those guidelines that were set in 1990. And so what efforts are underway if someone wants to get involved or support that? Are there advocacy groups that you recommend that are very active and vigilant on addressing some of the issues you've identified, or is that something that needs to be created? No, no, it's there. In fact, the woman who used to be the director of the mayor's office on disability, Mayor, mayor Sylvester Turner, brought her to Houston from the Obama administration, Maria Town is now the CEO and president of the American Association of People with Disabilities. And that's going to be the center of the action right there, AAPD. So if people, if people want to be advocates, if they want to join the disability movement, doesn't make any difference what their, what their characteristics are. We're very inclusive. Um, and you could be disabled tomorrow if you're not today. It's just an accident away. Um, the American Association of People with Disabilities in Washington, D.C., Maria Town is the president. And I must add that she's also a fellow alum of Emory. I'm an Emory alum, and so uh, em she was one of my classmates. So very proud of the work that Maria has, has done, not just for the city of Houston, but for the entirety of the disabilities community nationwide. So she's doing a great job. And I, I really, really find your personal story and the way you have not just had your own experiences, but always use those experiences to impact other people. I think that's truly inspirational, which is why I have this podcast to share stories of individuals who have used you know, challenges or adversity for the good of the whole or and for themselves as well. And so I just want to commend you, Lex. Uh, I know a lot of people tug on your time and on your expertise, but you have truly been a public servant in a very true sense because of the fact that you've given so much of your time, your knowledge and experience to making sure that the community is better off as a result. And so I can't thank you enough. I think your story is very powerful. I think you uh, have done so much good work in the community. And, and again, 
uh, you are truly a leader nationwide. And so I wanted to highlight your story. And just for those who might be out there uh, who may have experienced their own personal challenge, um, what would you say as words of encouragement to them in terms of how to use that as a pivot point either for themselves or to help other people? Well, first of all, if people have been confronted with barriers and they believe they're a violation of the Americans with Disabilities Act, they should call 1-800-949-4232. Can you repeat that? one 949 It's the ADA Technical Assistance Line. Or they should call the U.S. Attorney's Office, which is always interested in enforcing ADA. Excellent. And I think that's important, too, because I've talked to and as you recall, uh, I was on the campaign trail running for U.S. Senate. And I remember in recent months having conversations with individuals about uh, enforcement and questions that people have in with regard to enforcement. And I think it's really important uh, that we make sure that people know, again, the population is in flux. You know, as you mentioned, one day you may be uh, not a part of the dis- a disabilities community, and the next day you might be. And so having that knowledge, understanding uh, what the resources are and what they're not, I think is important as well. So I really appreciate that. And if people want to find you or learn more about you, is there anything that you recommend that they do in terms of learning more about your work in the disabilities community? They can go to LexFrieden.com and see some of the things I've written and done. Excellent. Well, thank you so much, Lex. Your story is powerful, but even more so the work that you have done. And so I really appreciate you joining me and sharing your story, but more importantly, sharing your life and wisdom with others so that the community is better as a result. That concludes our Edwards Empowerment Talks for this episode. And I want to encourage you all to continue to tune in. I would like to extend a special thank you to the Texas Signal for its support of our podcast.